Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to part five of my uh, mini-series here on the isolated Queen's Pawn. This is uh, top 10 middle game ideas number two. And uh, I'm continuing from the previous video, uh, looking at things from the point of view of the side that is fighting against the isolated Queen's Pawn. And this is my final video in this series. After this, we'll go on to the next topic. So um, in this position, this came from a, a Nimzo Indian defense. Uh, with the black pieces, we have Lajos Portis, a famous uh, Hungarian grandmaster, and his opponent here is Laszlo Zabi. This game was Sapi. This game was played in 1964, and um, this uh, I'll include a pointer to the game in the uh, in the description of the video here, if you want to check it out some more. In this position, Lajos decided to create the isolated queen's pawn. He took on c4. White takes back. And um, first it looks a little bit um, suspicious for black, but this is actually a very common position. Um, why I say it's a little bit suspicious is it seems like uh, white has more space and uh, black is back, somewhat backwards in development. But it is uh, black's turn to move here. And uh, well, we'll see that white hasn't completed uh, his development either. So um, black starts out very logically with b6. He's going to fianchetto this bishop. And... Um, He's just going to keep the pressure up on this d5 square, keep that uh, isolated queen's pawn under restraint, the, the very common strategy. Let's see, um, white goes with queen e2 to um, unpin that pawn. Well, it's also to bring a rook over to support the pawn, get the queen off the back rank. Um, bishop to b7, and now bishop to g5, pinning the knight. And with this pin, there's this uh, sometimes annoying threat of pushing the uh, isolated queen's pawn forward there and disrupting the center. Um, so uh, black decides for a radical solution here. And this is actually quite a common uh, move in this position. So it's a, it's a common technique. It's actually to go ahead and give up the bishop pair here and uh, create this uh, pawn duo. So instead of an isolated queen's pawn now, this structure has been transformed and there's two pawns, but they still have some of the same uh, weaknesses and uh, that the uh, isolated queen's pawn has. And uh, well, we looked at this from white's point of view earlier, or from the point of view of the side with the isolated queen's pawn, and we saw that there are dynamic possibilities, but now I want to show how uh, black can fight against that. So for now, it's time to uh, complete the development. Knight comes over here defending the other knight, and this frees up the queen to move away so that um, so that the exchange on f6 doesn't mess up the uh, pawn structure here on the king side. The rook comes over to c1 in preparation to uh, support this pawn and push it forward, and the queen goes to c7. And this um, move is, is why, also rook to c8 is possible there as well, uh, but this move is why uh, black's development wasn't as bad as it seemed at first, because this comes with a tempo, kicks the bishop back, and we see that both sides have... Um, kind of an equal position from the point of view of development. All of black's pieces are off the back rank, the rooks are connected, and black is already uh, trying to develop some pressure against these pawns. Um, but uh, well, what black decides at this point is to force some exchanges. And just as we saw against uh, the isolated queen's pawn, it sometimes helps the side that's fighting against it to uh, exchange off the minor pieces. The same thing is true uh, when you're fighting against this pawn duo. You want to take away those minor pieces and make it more difficult for white to defend those pawns and also reduce white's dynamic possibility because what white is looking for in this position is to push those pawns forward, uh, open up some lines, and get some dangerous attack going. So knight g4 is a move that uh, practically forces some exchanges. This move comes with a, a threat. Uh, the knight and the... Uh, queen are coordinating on h7, and so the threat is just to take off that knight on f3, and coordinating on h2. Take off the knight on f3, and then mate on h2. So um, white needs to do something about this. You know, it is possible to play a move like g3 there, but that's a little bit weakening along the long diagonal there. And so kind of the more natural move and the, uh, the approved move from a chess engine point of view is to block that bishop along this diagonal, eliminate that dangerous piece. But, uh, well, this has helped black a little bit. Black has um, 
managed to get rid of one of the bishops, so white no longer has the bishop pair advantage. And then um, well, black just drops his knight back, mission accomplished, and it comes with a tempo against the queen. So the queen drops back to e2. And now black plays rook a to c8, trying to uh, increase the pressure against the c-pawn, and white decides to push the c-pawn forward. White, as we'll see in this game, is going for uh, dynamic play. That's kind of white's uh, strategy here. And, uh, and black is trying to restrain that. So um, black plays queen to b7. We'll see where the queen is going in a minute. Um, the other rook comes out. So that's the point of getting the queen off the back rank. Both rooks come over to support these hanging pawns. That's what these are called. The, uh, when they're side by side, they're hanging pawns. Both of them can come under fire. Uh, but also both of them can be pushed forward to disrupt things over here uh, in the center and the queen side. Um, black throws in the move h6, and the bishop drops back to f4. I think uh, white decided that was a more active post for the bishop. And now the queen goes to a6, and this week is the uh, idea of that uh, queen maneuver. First of all, getting out of the direct line of the uh, c rook, and then secondly, coordinating with uh, his rook against the uh, c4 pawn. But also there's this interesting uh, idea here. There's a pin along this diagonal. The queen is unprotected on e2. So for example, if, uh, if white were to play h3 here, this is uh, one line that's actually playable. It's not, not necessarily a bad line. Um, the knight can hop into d5, hitting the bishop. The bishop could drop back to g3, and then uh, black could decide where to go from here maybe find some clever way to reposition the knight. Um, yeah, it's not clear what the best continuation is there. I just wanted to show those possibilities to explain why uh, white played this somewhat peculiar move, king to f1. And just the idea is to protect the queen so that that pawn is no longer pinned. Uh, knight to d5 is not a possible move. So this is kind of a uh, restraint strategy. White is just trying to take moves away from uh, black. Let's see. From a chess engine point of view, it didn't think that was. It thought that was one of the moves that that should be considered, but it liked liked other moves better. Uh, for example, uh, rook to c2 or queen to c2 would both fit the same purpose. And also, as I said, h3 was playable there. So this move looks a bit funny, and and I would have to say it's maybe not an entirely successful experiment here. But, well, your opponent has to make some mistakes for you to win. So, um, And it's not a huge mistake. Things are, things are still fine, really. So uh, black brings another rook to the center. It's going to have pressure against both of those two pawns. Bishop uh, repositions itself to e5, giving black the uh, option of trading off that bishop. Um, but black decides not to do that at this point. What he wants to do is just go after that c-pawn. He's going to double his rooks and just pile up on it. And so uh, white at this point decides to take off this knight um, and drag this knight away from where it might uh, increase the pressure on the pawn here. And now this knight hops into e5, hitting the rook. So dragging that knight away and uh, opening up the square on e5 for his knight. The rook drops back to c7. And now uh, rook to d3 is played here. And um, so... This looks like uh, things are okay for the moment. The knight here is defending the pawn along with the rook. This rook is uh, getting active along the third rank, and we see the typical kind of IQP strategy where, where white is going after the king side attack, but with somewhat reduced forces. Okay, and uh, black plays the interesting move, knight to e8. So a couple of ideas here. One is the knight could come forward to uh, d6, put more pressure on these pawns. And second idea is that that uh, knight on e5 is no longer stable. There's a threat of playing f6 and uh, kicking the knight away and just uh, winning that pawn. So uh, white at this point decides to allow it. As I said before, white is going for uh, active play. And um, he uh, moves his rook from c to d1. Just uh, giving up that pawn. Of course, black has to take on 
a peculiar looking pawn structure to win it. But um, anyway, Lyos Portish goes for this, decides to win that pawn. Knight goes to g4, and he grabs the c pawn. And I'm sure what Black is thinking is that there's going to be counterplay against the uh, the e pawn here. Although at the moment it is defended by the queen, so it's not it's not hanging, but it's a bit of a uh, <clears throat> a target. It's a, it's a restrained pawn because uh, this uh, well supported d pawn with the two rooks is keeping it from coming forward, and uh, and White can try and organize some ways to uh, apply pressure to it. But uh, only if he has time. <laughs> anyway, uh, white starts with knight to e3, kicking the queen back. Queen drops back to b5. And now d5, just uh, dissolving that uh, pawn immediately. Um, but black doesn't take right away. Uh, maybe he's a little bit worried about opening up his king side here. He first goes rook c to d7, piling up like this. And now... Um, White plays the move king to g1. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that was the most accurate move here. This leads back to trouble, but it could be that uh, White was a little concerned. You know, White moved the king to f1 to protect the queen when there was uh, that pin along this diagonal. He's moving the queen back because perhaps after the exchanges, he didn't want his queen to be taken off with check. There's always this intermediate move. Queen takes queen check as long as the king is on this square and... Uh, and when this rook moves away after the exchanges on d5. So it looks like he's trying to uh, create some exchanges in the center here under more favorable circumstances. Um, but, well, white goes ahead and dissolves the center here, and uh, black takes with the pawn. And, um, yeah, white is just a little bit better here. Um, he's got, uh, let's see, well, the, the knight is not really pinned, but uh, black does not want the uh, knight moving with check. So black plays king to h8. So now this, this knight can't escape with check. Um, he could play a move like knight to f4 here. That's certainly playable. And that would uh, lead to a position where it seems like um, uh, white just does not have enough compensation for the pawn. Um, another possibility would be queen to e4. Just uh, getting the queen out of the pen, defending the knight, and um, yeah, white gets to hold on to his extra material, but in the long run, uh, black has the extra pawn. <clears throat> I mean, white gets to hold on to the material that he has. He doesn't lose material in these lines, but he's down a pawn, and this extra pawn on the queen side is going to be uh, probably a winning advantage. But, um, well, he made a blunder here. I assume he played this move in time pressure we're on move uh, 31 and he's been looking looking for ways to uh, play aggressively and um, anyway he just played the move h4 to try and uh, protect his king from certain ideas of uh, back rank mates and but this is a horrible blunder so here's your uh, chance to find the uh, last move of the game what did black play here what's the winning move Okay, I'm going to give the answer away now. Uh, Black played the move, Rick takes d5. And uh, yeah, that finishes it because he can't take back. The, um, the queen is no longer protected, and there's once again a pin along this diagonal. So um, a pretty nice example from Black of fighting against the isolated queen's pawn, transforming the structure into a pawn duo, and then um, allowing white to push those pawns forward to create hanging pawns but uh, keeping up the pressure against those pawns. And uh, eventually that paid off. So, uh, well, let's take a look at the next game. I have one more example. The next game I wanted to show you was played between uh, Gudmundur Sigur, Sigur Jonsson and Bent Larsen. Um, so Bent Larsen with the black pieces is the famous uh, Danish grandmaster and world championship candidate, uh, Gudmundur. Sigur Jonsson is a Icelandic grandmaster many times champion of Iceland. And, uh, well, this game started uh, a little differently. It started actually with the e4, and um, Black went for the Kero Khan. Bent Larsen played the Kero Khan. And uh, let's just step through some of these moves here, because uh, after a few moves, we get to an identical position, yeah, right here, to uh, what we saw in the previous game, which actually came out of a... Um, 
came out of a uh, Nimzo Indian defense. So just another example of how uh, how these uh, isolated queen's pawn positions can arise from many different openings. Uh, let's see. Um, it's uh, Black's turn to move here. Black castled. I think uh, Black went b6 right away in the previous game, but uh, Ben Larson has a different plan, and we'll see it shortly. After White castles, he goes a6. So he's not going with this uh, b6 move, but he's taking an extra move to um, to set these queenside pawns forward uh, in a little more aggressive uh, position, a little more space on the queenside, and kicking this bishop back. So this bishop comes out to g5 to pin the knight, and uh, it seems like white is developing some threats to just push that d5, that d pawn forward to d5 and open things up. So b5 is well timed to kick that bishop back, put a stop to the expansion plans of that uh, pawn, and now bishop to b7 as we saw before. So we've got uh, this restraining influence on the d5 square. Queen goes to e2. And uh, you'll notice that a lot of these same moves we saw in the previous game, even though there's a difference, slight difference in the pawn structure here. Knight goes to d7, so the queen is free to move again. Rook f to d1. So the rook comes out here to support that uh, d pawn. Um, bishop goes to e7. So instead of trading, um, well, with this strategy of uh, pushing these pawns forward, the, uh, the, uh, the d pawn is restrained at the moment so white or black rather black doesn't have to worry about that um that pawn coming forward and he's not forced to trade off the knight so he drops his bishop back to e7 just unpins his knight and uh, maybe with ideas of uh, bringing the knight to d5 but uh white strikes first here hopping a knight into the center um, and black responds in kind black puts a knight in the center and this is going to force some trades um, you know, as white, you don't want these minor piece trades. You'd rather keep the minor pieces on, but sometimes you really can't avoid them. Uh, you know, white tries. White drops the bishop back to d2, but there are uh, uh, knights hanging, <laughs> and uh, and so some pieces are coming off here. Uh, Bent Larson takes on c3 first, and, um, you know, it is possible to play bishop takes c3 and maintain the uh, the isolated queen's pawn. That's a playable move here. And uh, also the move that was played, b takes c3, is a playable move for white. The chess engine rates both those positions as slightly better for um, white. White has a little more space. But notice that uh, white did not give up the, the bishop pair in this game. He kept his bishops. Um, let's see. Anyway, so it's just a, a free choice. Uh, White could play either way, and uh, the advantage of taking with the uh, pawn here is now this d-pawn is very secure. It's not going to come under pressure, but on the other hand, the c-pawn is backwards. And, um, well, with these advanced uh, queenside pawns, it's not going to be easy to push that c-pawn forward. So that's going to be um, kind of a weakness for the long term. Um, and, and white will, or black, black will try and exploit that. Um, but first, uh, black continues with uh, trading off the minor pieces. Just as when you're playing against a pure isolated queen's pawn, you're, you're better off getting rid of those minor pieces so you can bring your heavy pieces to bear against those uh, weakened pawns. And um, oh, black gets in a tempo on the queen. The queen goes over here to g3, looking at the king side and uh, trying to uh, get some threats going. There's potential ideas of the attack on h7 here but nothing immediate. So uh, black has time to play this move. Bishop to d5. Just more restraint against the c-pawn. Also a good central uh, location. It's actually looking in both directions. Um, the rook comes back to e1. There's not a whole lot for it to do on the d-file anymore that the d-pawn is firmly protected. This queen comes forward to d7. Now white plays queen g4. I'm not sure, but white goes in for some queen maneuvers here. Probably looking to get the queen to some better squares to uh, coordinate with the bishop. Um, the rook, the f rook comes over here to the c file. So black is already starting to pile up the pressure on that c pawn. First restrain it and then, then start to pressurize it. Um, so the rook comes up to e3, a good attacking move, both attacking and defending. It's indirectly defending, uh, lending defense to c3 and ready to swing over here to the king side and join the queen and the bishops in on the attack. So uh, Bent Larson at this point feels compelled to play g6. 
creating a slight weakness, but shutting down ideas on the light squared diagonal. The queen goes to f4, so looking at the dark squares now. The bishop drops back to g7. Yeah, it was, it was a tempo on the bishop as well. And now h4, just uh, going for the attack, trying to open up some lines. So the queen goes to c7. Uh, black would uh, love to neutralize the attack by trading queens. And uh, Goodmunder is not having any of it. He goes queen to g5, keeping the queen on the dark squares and avoiding the trade. And now um, it seems, though, uh, just from looking at this with the chess engine, it seems that um, white is actually getting into trouble by uh, constantly avoiding these queen trades. It allows his, uh, his queen to be pushed around and Bent Larsen is sort of taking advantage of it. Um, so one option here really was just to go ahead and trade. Take that, take the queen, say rook takes, and uh, well, <laughs> of course rook takes is forced. Then bringing this e rook back to e1 and um, seems like black or white is okay in this position, but not better. It seems like already um, black is doing, uh, has at least equalized and uh, can start pushing forward with uh, ideas like b4 is what I wanted to show. It's it's possible to uh, undermine this uh, pawn after you've restrained it with, uh, with this pawn. So the exchange here leads to the loss of the uh, leads to loss of the uh, center pawn. But, uh, well, like I said, uh, there's still, this is still a game. Um, you know, white now has the majority on the queen side and uh, black has the majority in the center. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a game to be played there. Um, queen g5, just uh, while it's not losing, it just seems to be uh, kind of on the path to getting, getting white into trouble. Let's see. Um, in fact, um, yeah, actually, it already is. Uh, it is a, a bad move. I, I kind of misstated that because uh, well, Ben Larson didn't take full advantage of it. But just to show, uh, he could have played f6 here, kicking the queen, gaining a tempo. The queen goes back to g4, and bishop to h6, and this uh, wins a pawn because after the rook moves, then uh, then the uh, pawn can be the uh, bishop on d2 can be traded off and then the queen can grab the c3 pawn. So already um, black is in a little bit of trouble. That's why I was looking for alternatives to queen to g5 there. Uh, Bent Larson actually played h6 here, kicking the queen, and the queen went back to g4. But now the h pawn is in the way, so he doesn't have this uh, bishop g, uh, bishop h6 idea to uh, trade off the dark squared bishop. Um, so white uh, continues pressing the attack with h5. Oh no, I'm sorry. White just got kicked back to g4. Um, black blocks the queen, <clears throat> blocks the pawn by playing h5. The queen goes back to g5, and then uh, queen to d8, once again offering this uh, queen trade. And once again, the queen trade is refused. The queen goes to f4, but now this queen comes out to f6. So the queen is uh, getting active. <clears throat> once again, the best move here is probably trading queens. But well, Goodmunder is still trying to keep his attacking hopes alive here, so he drops his queen back to g3. And now we see this b4 idea again. So this pawn has been successfully restrained, that c pawn, and then you can push this b pawn forward to, uh, to force a trade. And um, let's see, uh, white first throws in the move rook to e5. So it's kind of an intermediate move. He doesn't take right away. This is a big threat because the uh, bishop is threatening to come here and trap the queen. So uh, so black needs to respond to that. He drops his queen back to d8. And now, um, now white takes the pawn. But uh, this actually loses the exchange. The, uh, uh, the, the rook having come forward there is under the glare of the bishop. Let's see, did he have a choice here? He could have tried um, rook to g5, got the rook out of the way of the, um, of the bishop, and tried to uh, maybe get some pressure here against uh, g6. But, uh, well, that does lose the pawn, b takes c3. So black is coming out better in any line here. So, um, yeah, Goodmunder decided to go ahead and give up the exchange here, take the pawn on the queen side, and uh, try for his chances in this position. 
So after this exchange, queen takes. It gets a good centralized queen there. But, uh, well, this drops another pawn over here. The H pawn goes. And so if we pause to count, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah, it's um, five pawns to five, and, uh, and white is down the exchange. But his pieces are active, so it's probably still... Uh, chances in his mind. Well, the chess engine is pretty skeptical at this point. Thinks thinks black is doing well. Um, so he plays rook to f1 here. What he's doing is he's uh, preparing the move uh, f3, which he couldn't play right away. If if he played f3 now, mm, well, no, I, I guess he he might have considered playing f3 immediately. I was thinking there was a a sacrifice here. The bishop takes f3. But uh, I guess that's not quite working yet. Anyway, rook to f1 he played. Um, f6 kicking the queen. The queen goes back down to uh, e3. And then he plays rook to a7. This is uh, both a defensive move and an aggressive move. It's um, getting the rook off the back rank and preparing to swing it over here to the king side. And also defending against some breakthroughs over here. So like bishop takes, uh, bishop takes um, g6 could be met by rook to, rook to g7. And uh, that would be awkward for white. White played uh, f3 here. That was the idea that he was going for. He's just trying to shut down the, the bishop's attack along this, um, along this diagonal. Um, g5 is played. Uh, black is just pushing forward with uh, his pawns on the king side now. This rook lifts up to f2, defending along the second rank. And then, uh, let's see, queen to g3. Now we've got this uh, pin operating against uh, g2. <coughs> and um, a4, so just pushing pawns forward on the queen side. h4, continuing on the king side. Um, the king goes to f1, unpinning that pawn. And uh, maybe looking to run away from the uh, onrushing attack, but I think it's uh, too late. Uh, Bent Larson pushes on with h3, um, and uh, Gudmunder takes the pawn. But after queen takes h3, king is forced to the middle of the board. Let's see, the queen comes to g3. Uh, let's see, this queen drops back to g2, maybe looking to uh, support a rook coming to. Uh, I mean, queen drops back to e2. Maybe supporting a rook coming to g2, chasing the queen away. But uh, Bent Larson plays the move queen to g1 check. And uh, uh, Goodmunder decided, well, this is move 40, so he reached the time control. And he decided to resign at this point. Um, so one, one point about this position is that the uh, rook cannot come back. Well, if the rook comes back to chase the queen away, the queen will grab another pawn here just increasing black's advantage further. So the only way to avoid uh, further loss of material, yeah, the king has no moves, is to block with the queen. That would force a queen trade, and this would be a hopeless uh, endgame for uh, white with uh, being down a pawn. And, uh, oh, not down a pawn, just down the exchange, but having some weak pawns as well. Um, pretty straightforward win for a champion like uh, Bent Larson. Okay, so that uh, finishes this series on the isolated queen's pawn. Um, next, I'm going to take a look at a new topic, uh, top 10 middle game ideas number three, which is the, um, the Pillsbury attack and the Stonewall attack. They uh, share a common uh, pawn structure with attacking kingside potential. Pretty interesting uh, setup, and I will be uh, taking a look at that next. See you then.